Welcome to Biz Radio Canada, an affiliate of Biz TV Canada. Biz Radio Canada is a celebration of entrepreneurship and those who contribute to it every day. Biz Radio Canada and Biz TV Canada provide informative, educational and entertaining interviews with authors, experts and entrepreneurs who share their insights and advice on a variety of business topics. The host of Biz Radio Canada, David Boychek, invites you to participate and join in with his guests, ask questions, seek advice, or make a comment. All you need to do is call in and be part of the show. If you're shy, don't worry. You can send an email to the host during the show at host at bizradiocanada.com and ask your question. Are you ready? Let's get the conversation started with the outspoken guru, mentor, and advocate of entrepreneurs in Canada, your host, David Wojcik. Welcome to Biz Radio Canada on Connect Me Radio. Thanks for tuning in and listening. For those of you who would like to know more about our show and our upcoming topics and guests, you can visit us at bizradiocanada.com. And if you would like to see hundreds of business videos with advice and great interviews, you can visit our affiliate, BizTV Canada at biztvcanada.com. Of course, we are always happy to have you follow us on Twitter using the handle at Biz Radio Canada or at Biz TV Canada. What's on your bucket list? Race a car? Sail the ocean? How about climb Kilimanjaro? And if you did, what would you learn from that experience that would help you in your business? That's exactly what my next guest did. Nina Spencer is the best-selling author of Getting Passion Out of Your Profession. Profiled by the National Post as one of Canada's leading motivational speakers and recurring communications guru for our show, Biz TV Canada. Her experience through the training, preparation, and climbing of the world's tallest freestanding mountain provided the impetus for the book. Welcome, Nina. Thanks so much for coming in. Oh, it's a pleasure to be back. Thank Great you, David. Great to see you, and you've climbed this, this mountain and you wrote a book about it. Which came first? Were you climbing the mountain to write the book or uh, did you want to write a book so you climbed the mountain? That's a great question. And it's the second. It's the latter. I climbed the mountain and then while preparing, it occurred to me, I could write a book about this. <laughs> uh, but it was with pure heart that I decided to climb the mountain and it wasn't on my bucket list. So many people who make that kind of a decision do so because it's a, a dream that they've had since, sure. since they were teenagers or whatever. For me, I didn't even know the week before I would sign on that I would sign on. It was a matter of one thing leading to another and then finally it rang true. For me, uh, the story goes like this. In 2009, my dearest friend of 32 years died of breast cancer. Mm. And then two weeks later, my dog, <laughs> this is a sad story, it's supposed to be an inspirational story, but sure my we'll dog, and I've only ever had <laughs> one dog, and bless his little heart, he um, passed away from oral cancer mm -hmm. at 13. So we had a nice long life, but not my friend at 52 years of age. And then the following month, I got an email from a friend, um, a woman that I knew just ever so generally from a club I belong to. And in that email, she sent it out to a lot of people saying that she was arranging to uh, uh, gathering a team of people together to go and climb Mount Kilimanjaro to help raise funds for the uh, for a women's leadership center for master's studies on the campus of the University of the Africa International University in Nairobi. Mm. Who wants to go? Who wants to go? Who wants to go? And you immediately and threw your no, hand up. No, <laughs> no, I did not. As a matter of fact, I looked at it, I thought, oh, isn't that nice? Delete. And she sent that email out every Thursday afternoon for weeks and months and every Thursday afternoon because there there was other things in the the newsletter as well from the club so I would scroll through it and I'd see that once again and I would delete 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 six months later in June of 2010 uh, one Thursday afternoon in comes the uh, buzz it's called the Verity buzz uh, newsletter and I had just finished having a, a sad moment, you know, just mm -hmm. a bit of a weepy moment and feeling, you know, melancholy about missing my friend and so on. And then when I swung around and dried my eyes and went to my email, as we all mm -hmm. do after we've been away from our desk, 
clicked on it, and there it was again. And this time, you know, this this uh, that expression about the, you can't stop an idea once its time has come. I'm not saying right. it as eloquently as I think Victor Hugo said it or whoever it was, but uh, that's what happened. All of a sudden, it stuck me like a dagger. I thought, I want to go do this. So I wrote her an email. The woman's name was Ruth. And I wrote her an email, and it was, I said, I'm scared. This is just tire kicking. I don't really want to do this. I'm, I'm just asking, right? It's even courageous for me to ask. And she um, said, everybody feels that way. Why don't we meet? Mm-hmm. Just meet. It's just an information, no obligation. But you're in a, you were in great shape anyways. I mean, you, you hike. You, uh, I you did do a lot of outdoorsy stuff. No. No? Uh, no. As a matter of fact, all that I've came... I've had this impression of you all no. this time. Oh, you're, you're smoking so, mirrors. You're, you're, so, uh, you're so outdoorsy. <laughs> Well, the thing is, um, I, I met her, uh, and I, the minute I, I looked at her, I knew that I would go. Because some people just have that leadership power, that magnetism, that charisma, whatever words you want mm-hmm. to call it. And she had it, and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to go climb a mountain. And how much preparation was there there be- from the time you said, yes, I'm going, mm-hmm. until you actually hit the base. Seven months. Seven so, months. So the thing, I believe, that David, you and I came to know each other after this, which is why you're, you've been left with the impression that I've been doing this all my adult life. But it was not that way. The reality of it was, I came home and I told my husband, well, guess what I did today? I put down a big deposit check. I'm going to kill him in jail. Bless his heart, he's always so supportive, and he goes, yeah, good on you, this is great. And I think honey, it was his I'm, idea for the I'm book. And I'm going with you. Yeah, no, 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 he doesn't like camping. <laughs> he wants his own home and every, every night. He doesn't mind going out in the wilds in the day, but he wants to be home at night. So I told a couple of other friends, because I believe in business, it's true, that you must uh, tell only those people in the beginning, when something is, is new and it's fragile and it's growing... It's like a little sapling. Mm -hmm. You don't want to tell people that will be naysayers or tell you, yeah, but, or don't do it. So I just told a small little circle of people. and uh, The ones you believed would support the idea? Yes, absolutely. And I think that that's paramount for any of us with any goals and any dreams. If if you're really committed to this, don't be throwing the pearls to swine, (laughs) as they say. you got to tell only the people who are going to say, go, David, go. (laughs) Um, They may want to share some some caveats or some wisdom, but not to step on your dreams before they're even off the ground. Mm -hmm. So in this case, one of my uh, dear friends said, well, you'd better start training, right? This is a law of the harvest. You'd better start training now. So a friend of mine, I live down at Ossington and Bloor area in the city of Toronto, and a friend of mine who lives in Forest Hill, which is about, I guess, maybe three or four kilometers away or whatever, invited me for a coffee that day. And I thought, well, there's no time like the present. And so I decided so to walked? walk. I walked up that big, huge that go? That Castle go? Loma Hill. <laughs> Listen, you're talking to a kind of person who went in the car to go five minutes to the grocery store, you know, who can get to the grocery store in 45 seconds by car. So like they s- Forrest Gump said in the movie... Um, Forrest Gump. <laughs> uh, if I was going somewhere, I was running. <laughs> if I was going somewhere from that point on, I was walking. So the training of the seven months included about 20 to 30 K of urban walking every week, get mm-hmm. out there and, and log those K along the waterfront through our beautiful parks and so on. But then every second week I went up to Algonquin Park And I'd never, ever been to Algonquin Park. And it broke my heart when I saw how beautiful it was that um, it took me until that age in my life to go and see it. But it's a wonderful um, training ground for doing any uh, incline and, and, you know, that you can drive to. I couldn't get to Whistler. Right. Uh, Now, one of the things that I do want to find out when we come back from the break Mm -hmm. is... What are some of the lessons that you learned along the way Mm -hmm. that can be applied to business? There's Mm -hmm. obviously a certain amount of of tenacity. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a certain amount of determination. There's a certain amount of of sacrifice Mm -hmm. to uh, attain this goal. Mm -hmm. So when we come back from the break, we are going to talk about that. We are speaking with Nina Spencer. Climbed Kilimanjaro, wrote a book about it, and now... We're going to apply that 
to business. And we will be back with more Biz Radio Canada on Connect Me Radio right after the break. Welcome back to Biz Radio Canada on Connect Me Radio. My guest is Nina Spencer. She wrote a book about climbing Kilimanjaro. And we are talking about what she learned from that climb that can be applied to business. Before the break, Nina, we were I was mentioning that the, the three things that would have to be in your lexicon when you're training for the climb, self-sacrifice, or self, uh, self-sacrifice. There has to be tenacity. There has to be determination. There has to be focus that's going on in your life. That seven months before the climb, mm. did you completely, was it complete focus on that goal? Because yeah. there's a lot of training, not just physically, but Mm -hmm. mentally as well? Sure. That's an excellent question. I'm a conference keynote speaker. I'm an entrepreneur. I run my own business. So all of my business had to continue going. And I had to wedge this in as well. Mm -hmm. My mom used to say, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. And that they can always end up finding that, that, um, you know, that 25th hour of the day and so on. Are you suggesting you became more productive during the seven months beforehand? You are? Yes, yes, I am. Because the things that needed to get done got done. And I just managed to find a way. Maybe I shortchanged an hour of sleep every now and then Mm -hmm. or, but uh, there's, there's definitely a a truth to the fact that once you're decided and you're 100%, that 99% is a killer, but 100% commitment to something means that I just found a way. I've, I found a way. Now, did you find yourself uh, being more critical about the prioritization of things that you would do mm-hmm. in your day where mm-hmm. someone might ask you to do something? Yeah, I'll do that. And you, can you go here? Yes, I'll go there. You know, can you do this for me over here? And where you might have done it before you all of a sudden now you'd had to become a mercenary and say, love to? No. Guess what? I'm just smiling at the very thought of you saying that about mercenary because how I, 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 you know, David's my friend. I want to see David, but I've got to log those K. David's my friend and I want to see David, but I've got to go to Algonquin this weekend. So what I ended up doing was recruiting all my friends you to help me train. <laughs> <laughs> I got them all fit. Oh, we got all fit all at once. And of course, there were about 19 different people who said, I'll go walking with you. I'll go hiking with you. Mm-hmm. And I was not a hiker. So you were thinking, oh, she's a hiker. But I learned one of the things that happens when we when we set a goal or we set a dream, we end up with a whole bunch of new skills that are residuals, bonus, gravy, if you will. What was a big one for you? In terms of... What was the new skill that you learned? I learned how to hike. Mm -hmm. I learned how to really get out there more often in the great outdoors. I embraced Algonquin Park, for goodness sake. It's only two and a half hours north of where I live, maybe three by the time you get into the park. Mm -hmm. But that's not so far away. My husband and I can do an up and down in one day now. We, We drive the three hours. We break it off at Huntsville. We have a little breakfast. We carry on to the trailhead. We do the trailhead for five or six hours, get in the car, come home. I would be thinking, what a waste of time. I could be getting so much work done rather than driving back and forth to Algonquin Park. It is so grand. And then there's that cherished time. So, you know, in the travel. So that's what I did. I managed to recruit a lot of friends and get them interested in a hobby now for me, mm-hmm. for anybody, if a certain age, middle age and beyond, it's a hobby that you can do for life, for the rest of your life, as long as your knees and hips and so on <laughs> hold up. And all the rest of the right? body parts hold up. Yeah. So I did that. Um, lessons learned, you know, there are 40, I was laughing because I'm thinking, oh, there are 42 lessons that I've captured in mm-hmm. the stories that go along with. But definitely one of them is if, if you need something done, give, a bi- give it to a busy person. Listen to your inner voice. Don't be bothering to pay attention to any of the yeah, but people. There were people that said to me, one woman said to me, my aunt did it last year. And no matter how hard she trained, it wasn't enough. And I'm telling you right now, no matter how hard you train, <laughs> it's not going to be enough. And I so remember- was it enough? Well, the thing is, even though at the time I was irritated- by that comment, because I thought, why would you want to be pulling somebody down when they're on their way to do something? But she, it, was, she probably thought she was helping. Well, you. that's just it. So many people are the naysayers, the negative naysayers, and 
they don't mean it that they're wired that way. And so therefore, that's how their advice goes. No matter how hard you train, it's not going to be enough. And I got a bit of buyer's remorse for a day or so and a bit scared. And I thought, well, it's too late now. I've written a check for a big amount of money. <laughs> you know, I'm into this. But then I thought, how does she know how much I'm going to train? Mm -hmm. And so that kicked my butt, quite frankly. And it made me be sure. And I think that that's important. There is a law of the harvest. And you can't join the the training experience in December if you're climbing in January and expect to maximize your probability of summiting. Mm -hmm. And that's whether literally or figuratively your goal. Which you know? which was the most exhilarating day? I know when, when people mm -hmm. start a business, you know, it's mm -hmm. exhilarating when on the day when you mm -hmm. start and when you get that first client mm -hmm. and and even more important when you get the first check from that first client. Yes. What was the exhilarating day for mm -hmm. you? Was it was it arriving at the base? Was it halfway up? Was it at the summit? Like, what was the big moment for you? Well, there are a few of those big moments. One of them that occurs to me, we drove eight hours from Nairobi to Tanzania because the part of Mount Kilimanjaro that we climbed uh, was in Tanzania, even though it straddles Kenya and Tanzania. But we had trained for seven months. We looked at the pictures. We read the books, all of that stuff. Many of us trained together when we could. And then on that bus, after about an eight-hour ride over really badly rutted African roads right out of National Geographic, I'd never been on any roads that were as rough as that in my life, somebody said, there it is. I see it. I see it. Then the next person, then the next person, and the next person. I was the last person to see it on the bus. And... Quite frankly, I didn't see it. I, but they kept saying, you know, over to the clouds, over to the left. So how could you not see it, Nina? Well, it's I couldn't huge. because it was all kind of like in the clouds. <laughs> oh, okay. And it just sort of was off in the distance. But there was a huge amount of exhilaration there. Uh, it wasn't until I took a picture anyway. And I thought, well, it's there somewhere. And I took the picture. Mm -hmm. So sometimes one of the lessons that I learned that I share from the platform is sometimes you can't see the vision, but the other people see it. Leaders will see it. And sometimes you just need to trust that they see it and go along. It'll, it will be revealed to me eventually. Yes. A really intense, scary day, which in its own way had its exhilaration, was called the Barranco Wall Day. And that was day four. And up until this point, Kilimanjaro is a trek. It's not um, a, a mountaineering, um, uh, uh, it's not mountaineering with ice picks and so on. It's a trek. But anybody who thinks that it's just a walk in a park is sadly mistaken because it can, that mountain takes people down by day three and day four all the time. It even took Martina Navratilova down on day three. I'm sure it would. We're um, going to pick up the conversation on the other side of the break. We're with mm -hmm. Nina Spencer, the author of A Time to Creep, A Time to Soar, and we will be back with Nina right after this short break. Welcome back to Biz Radio Canada on Connect Me Radio. My guest is Nina Spencer, best-selling author and the author of A Time to Creep, A Time to Soar, her uh, recount of climbing Kilimanjaro. So before the break, you were talking about this wall that you came across. Well, up until that point, as I was sharing, the uh, it's a trekking experience. But then the night before we went on the Barranco Wall, it, it was vertically this this vertical thousand foot cliff. At least it looked vertical from a from a distance, and nobody wanted to admit it. But we were all kind of whistling in the graveyard about this <laughs> one. We were all really scared and thought, "How are we going to get over this wall?" Because they said we're going up there on day five. So eventually we shared enough information and we self-disclosed and shared enough information with one another that one of our group actually went to the guides and said, you know, we're feeling a little bit scared about this and apprehensive, uncertain. And because we dared to come together and tell the truth and uh, didn't keep it to ourselves, and because we dared to share it with our leaders, the leaders redeployed some of the staff. We had 14 people climbing and 55 staff. And some of them s s went on ahead to the next campsite and so on. And uh, they redeployed and helped us across. Because what happened was this, and I think it's the same with so many of our goals, they look really big and scary and bigger than a bread box. But if you just take it one step at a time, I know it's such a cliche, but it's true. You just need to take the next step. And and you'll see, though, that's not so scary. Mm -hmm. University feels pretty scary when you're in grade six. So but, just breaking you know. it down helped you out. So what happened was when we got closer to the wall, we saw that it wasn't just a sheer vertical cliff. 
It essentially was, but it had all kinds of switchbacks. Mm -hmm. And those switchbacks, switchback trails are like the way mountain goats go on those little ledges. And we just zigzagged our way along these ledges. Now, if you had any vertigo, it would still be pretty intimidating because some of those ledges were a lot smaller than I realized. And, And I only realized that when I came home and looked at pictures. But I was very scared going across that. No time to um, cry, uh, but I would have out of fear if I could have. But at the time when something is scary, you need to focus and get through it. And when we finally reached the other side, then I blubbered like a baby. <laughs> so now, It was a stress release, right? So now you get to the summit, so that had to be pretty spectacular. Mm-hmm. But, and now you need to come down af- yes. afterwards. So. Yes. What's the feeling then? Is is it deflating? Because oh no, we you know we worked so hard. We worked seven months to get up here. Now we've and we we went through the wall that was so scary for us. Now we're up at the top, and now we need to come down. And is it anticlimactic for you? No, and here's why. Uh, the Branco Wall for me was the most challenging of the days, and even though. The summit day was also extremely challenging. I prepared so much psychologically, emotionally, physically. It was a very arduous day. There's no doubt about it. It was 15 hours up or 12 hours up and three hours down. And we had a very lovely day, comparatively speaking. It could be howling winds and minus 40. Mm. But comparatively speaking, our day was, was quite beautiful up on top. But we stayed too long because it was so warm. And I put that in air quotes. We (laughs) stayed too long and we only arrived at five o'clock and we stayed till five to six, which is unheard of to stay that long. What happened was this. We ran out of daylight. We ran out of daylight and we all had our headlights because we went in the dawn before in the pre-dawn. But we came down just with our um, our individual Uh, porters that were assigned to us individually maybe two and three and four climbers and their porters were going down as a group with me it was just me and my porter and another woman and her porter and we lost a lot of daylight Uh, it was very scary very treacherous and what I learned from that was it wasn't the end of the victory is not the summit. You got to get down because mm-hmm. it's no victory if you die before you get back to base <laughs> So camp. the summit is really just halfway. It will, and literally, truly, it is. Yeah. And I think how that... Well, and it's not easier coming back down. Well, it's trickier coming back down. I think it's easier to climb up something than it is mm-hmm. to climb down something. But what it did cause me to do was to constantly be in the moment. That moment of glory was that moment of glory. And that's over now. Now you need to focus on this. You can reflect way later, but we had to get back and we had to get back safely. So it became a matter of focusing on uh, the moment that's in front of you right now. And the lesson learned is um, it ain't over till it's over. Nina, you know. thanks so much for coming in and talking to us about the uh, about your book. Check out Nina Spencer, A Time to Creep, A Time to Soar. That's all the time we have for today. If you would like to comment about the show or suggest a topic for discussion, send an email to David at host at bizradiocanada.com. We always enjoy hearing from our listeners. And if you joined in late and want to hear this or any other of our shows in complete form, go to www.bizradiocanada.com. We invite you to join in next week for another informative, educational, and entertaining conversation with Canada's thought leaders in business, right here on Biz Radio Canada.